Okay, so uh, hello everyone and welcome to the monthly case webinar series. My name is Seidel and I'm the customer success specialist of Collective Minds Radiology. Uh, I really hope that you had a good day today and I know that you're very, very excited to this, uh, for this webinar. And I'm also glad that so many of you have joined today and uh, I would like to thank everyone for their contribution on our feedback evaluation form uh, that we sent out each, uh, after each webinar together with the CPD certificate uh, of the webinar pretty much. Uh, all of you who have joined today should have an account. So I'll send a case collection in the Zoom chat where you can go through the cases together with Dr. Lasker. Uh, because you know the good thing about collective minds is that you can, you can view the cases independently but also simultaneously. And it actually makes the teaching session more interactive if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be your host. And if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat function or email us at support at cmra.com. And if you would like to talk during the webinar, uh, simply just ask or raise your hand and I will, I will enable your microphone. And uh, with that being said, uh, please, Dr. Lasker, please uh, don't take over. <laughs> hmm. Hi everyone, uh, thank you. It feels like a long time since we last did one of these. Why, why is that? I don't know why. Uh, was it a month ago or was it more than that? Did we take a break? Did we take a break? Um, anyway, so what I'll do, I will uh, open the chat so I can see what people are saying. Um, my, um, uh, my good friend Saido will be putting up the link in a few minutes so that you guys will be able to work through the cases. So what we're going to do today is go through some normal x-rays, just go through x-rays, and then I've got a few interesting CT cases, and then someone has contributed a CT case from what I understand. Um, I had a quick look at it, and... Um, yeah, let's just say it's quite interesting. Um, all right, so um, uh, just some hi to everyone, and um, I'm going to start opening case number one. Go. So just let me know if you can't see my screen. Can everyone see my screen? If you just say yes, that'd be great. Just a yes, so I know I can carry on. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, we'll look at this chest X-ray. Feel free to uh, just throw in what you think is going on. So this patient came in, and they've got shortness of breath. And so um, I'm going to go through it the way that I would go through it, using check areas and all that kind of thing. And by the way, um, we I obviously I do some lecturing for a company called Radiology Seminars. And next year we are running a course called Acute CT Body for Radiographers. So if you are interested, go, do go check out radiologyseminars.co.uk um, and be able to sign up and hopefully get some learning from us on that one day seminar. Um, so having a look at this, we can see that this is a chest X-ray. Yeah. Everything looks okay at first. Not sure why the patient is particularly breathless. And then the way to kind of approach these things to have a look at the lung apices, right? So first of all, you've got the lung apices, which are over here and over here, and that all looks okay. The cross phrenic angles look okay as well. So nothing jumping at us out just yet, but someone has thrown something. So someone has said what it looks like, but can you kind of localize where it could be? So then you've got your aortic knuckle, which is over here. Then you kind of come down, you've got your mediastinum, and then you've got your heart sitting over here. And then just behind here, you've probably got a little bit more of the aortic, the aorta kind of kind of swooping down like it's some sort of snake. Now, when you look at the lungs, the, the good way to do it is to sort of draw a square in one area and then draw another square in the other area and just make sure that you look from side to side to make sure it's all symmetrical. And then exactly right, someone has mentioned that there is what it looks like. And don't worry, the cases will get more interesting as we go along. Um, we have got what looks like a lesion that is sitting within this region over here. Now, what you'll notice about this lesion when I zoom in is that this lesion has got quite a well-defined scent, like medial border. So if you look at that, very, very nicely defined. But then as you come off to this side, it becomes a little bit less well-defined. It becomes a bit ill-defined, as it were. So it looks like what, uh, I guess it looks like a comet in this particular situation. Not that there's no sign called a comet sign. I'm just saying it looks like a comet. And then, so when you've got sort of an ill-defined border, so lateral border, then that suggests to you that this is actually not going to be a pleural mass per se. It's going to be more likely to be a um, not like a more likely, less likely to be a lung mass. It's more likely to be a pleural mass, and that means that's kind of on the chest wall. And the reason it's kind of looking all shady on one side and more well defined on the other is because it's kind of curving around the side, and we're getting sort of a smudged image uh, when we see it. So this is actually like a pleural lesion, and end up being a pleural plaque. So yeah, lung mass, yes, but I think you can say a little bit more than that when you come to this particular X-ray. Okay, we're starting off easy. We're gonna we're gonna get to some more interesting things as we go along. 
So in case number two, uh, we're, let's concentrate on the um, the hand X-ray. So we've had this is a kind of classic, classic, classic. So we're going to start off easy. And um, if anyone can see it, please do let me know. And otherwise, I'm going to go through how to look at this particular X-ray. Um, what you'll always notice, and actually, believe it or not, I've been doing a lot of X-rays. Exactly. Someone said it. I've been doing a lot of X-rays for sort of... Um, people who are unfortunately in prison and um, a lot of them do have this particular x-ray uh, which is really unfortunate it kind of tells you and they'll always say it's something else but it just kind of tells you about what life could be like in that unfortunate situation and um, yeah exactly right so you always go for that fifth go for the fifth and the fourth so fifth is always the one to go for first have a look at the neck and yeah straight away people have noticed that but then don't just stop there have a look at the base make sure there's no fracture there make sure there's no fracture there look at the shafts all the way along make sure there's no fracture look for any soft tissue swelling so there's not much in the way of soft tissue swelling and the final thing is i'm going to zoom on this final bit that i want to make sure that everyone knows about is this what they call light of day sign a light of day sign is where you've got this line going through like this a bit of daylight spanning through the joints and if that's missing then you may be worried about a fractured dislocation or just a dislocation but in this particular situation what we have here is just a um a fracture of that neck of that fifth metacarpal so very very common like someone said it's a box fracture what ends up happening is when someone punches they don't punch quite correctly as it were and so the forces go wrong down the right wrong side of the hand and instead of going right down so the mid side it goes kind of angulated and ends up fracturing that neck um it's all about how you punch how you land that punch is very very important and so um generally speaking yeah i mean there's ways to punch and the ways not to punch so this is um quite a good case i think so this patient comes in with loin to groin pain very very common thing for people to come in with so what i'm going to do is i'm going to rotate this round you guys can um, have a look at it i'm going to start downloading it and just feel free to tell me what you think is going on so loin to groin pain is what this patient has come in with so when you've got loin to groin pain straight away you should be thinking to yourself all right what could cause loin to groin pain depending on the side obviously but let's say it's right side i can't remember exactly but let's say it's right side of uh, loin to groin pain obviously it could be a calculus a stone a stone could be causing obstruction uh, it could be causing obstruction on the kidneys and when it goes down the ureter it starts to cause a lot a lot of pain things that can also cause yeah i'll tell you why in just a second um so the other thing that i can cause is so the other things that can cause loin to groin pain is i guess an appendicitis a diverticulitis could cause a loin to groin pain um fractures as well like i've seen fractures turn up with loin to groin pain because people aren't quite sure they can't localize the, the pain so with this person someone's asked me why is this patient facing upside down so yeah exactly right so someone has noticed that this patient is actually facing downwards so they're facing this way and you know that because the table is sitting over here so the reason why they're doing that is because this is a very specific kind of scan. This is called a CTKUB. And when you're doing a CTKUB, you're looking specifically for renal calculi. Why is that important? Because of gravity, right? So first things first, it, the, the ureters are quite mobile on some level. So when you're sitting forwards on some level, the ureters will kind of flop a bit further away from the psoas muscles, which are sitting over here and over here. But more importantly than any of that, and actually the real reason you do it for most of the time is when you go down to the urinary bladder, you want to see if this calculus is sitting within the vesicular ureteric junction. And for those that don't know what that is, you've got your ureters that go all the way down and then connect over here. And let's say the other one is somewhere down here, right? So if you've got a calculus that's kind of lodged it in this area over here, then it's not going to move when the patient is facing downwards. But let's say it's like a free calculus that's already passed through, done its damage, then when the patient is lying on the front, the stone is going to sit over here. So in this particular situation, hopefully you may have seen that there is something a bit odd going on down there. Slightly high density sitting over here, and it's not flopped and sat forwards down here, as you'd expect if it was a loose calculus. Um, yeah, so you can do a lateral decubitus as well. I guess it might just depend on the comfort of the patient, um, what's easiest for you. And actually, I've seen some places not even bother doing this. Like, I thought it was commonplace to um, have someone facing uh, downwards, but in some places, they don't even bother doing that for whatever reason. So I guess it depends on the radiologist and what they're used to, what they like. But um, most places I work will make the patient oh. face forwards. So I'm going to carry on. So first off, we're kind of going from the very, very top here. And hopefully you would have seen that um you got one, one kidney here which is the right kidney and the left kidney that's over here just going to get the pen and so when you look at this kind of pelvic ureteric junction you can see a lot of renal fat sitting here but in this region here there's like a lack of renal fat the fat looks a bit squashed on top of that that pelvic ureteric junction looks very very widened compared to the other side so clearly there's something abnormal going on on the right side of the body 
So now what we're going to do is sort of scroll our way down and just see what could be causing it. And actually, you may have noticed that there are a few more calculi sitting here. There's a few more calculi sitting within this kidney as well. So that kind of makes a few alarm bells start going, OK, so this person's clearly someone who forms a lot of stones. And on top of that, now they've got a situation where they've got a blocked ureter. It takes a lot of practice trying to follow these ureters. But what you're going to do is try, yeah, kind of after a while, sometimes you can't see the ureter, but you, you kind of anticipate where it would be. But I'm going to keep my mouse where I think the ureter is. I can still see it there, still see it there, still see it there. Bit difficult, but I can still see it there. A few vessels getting in the way, but my mass is still in that situation here. Bit difficult, not entirely sure now, but now I think I'm veering inwards, veering inwards, not entirely sure. I think I might have lost it. So then what sometimes you could do is work your way backwards. And I think maybe that's a ureter going that way and coming upwards. So then if we come this way, you can see that, yeah, I think that ureter is going this way, this way, this way. And what you do have is a calculus that is sitting over here. Uh, anybody having trouble with the screen? I don't have any trouble with the screen right now. Um, so then look, you can see this calculus sitting over here, right? And because it hasn't flopped forwards, you think to yourself, okay, this must be stuck within the vesicular ureter junction. If it wasn't the vesicular ureter junction, it would have flopped forwards. Okay, so that's it, we're done, right? We've sorted that out. But no, that's not, you know, the whole point I give you these cases, sometimes some cases are just, yeah, slam dunk, but this particular one is not such a slam dunk situation. Because you've got someone that has a lot of stones and they said to you, I come in a fair bit and, um, you know, I'm having a situation where I've got stones every now and again, but I've got a constant backache. I'm having a lot of painkillers and that kind of thing. And you think, OK, well, you know, when you've got stones, painkillers help. Do painkillers help? Yeah, painkillers help. Great. Uh, not non-issue. So you think, OK, well, you're just someone who has a lot of stones. What, what's the problem? We don't, we don't need to do anything else, right? But then you've got to look at everything else as well. So let's have a look at the lungs, if I can get the lung windows going. So lung windows, yeah, lung windows look fine. No issues there, no problems whatsoever. Now let's look at the uh, rest of the body as well. So we've got the liver that's sitting over here. That looks okay. Gallbladder sitting over here. That looks okay. Sitting in front, you've got the pancreas sitting around this region. That looks all right. And then you've got the spleen over here. So everything looks okay. Bowel, I'm just going to take my word for it. Bowel looks all right as well. So bowel looks completely fine. So then what we need to do is have a look a little bit further and go across to the bone window. So bone windows... As you scroll through, I'm going to see if anyone can see what I'm talking about, or is there anything wrong with the bones as you kind of scroll down? You let me know. Tell me what you think. Someone throw at me if you see anything. Anything, anything at all? What about here? Fine. No takers just yet, which is fine. So what we're going to do, is I'm going to also show you the sagittal views, and maybe that will help as well, try and cement what's going on. Oh, what happened there? OK, here we go. We're back. Put into bone windows again. So if I come to this region over here, can anyone see it? No, no takers just yet? Yeah, good. Someone, someone's gone for it. So not just that. Yeah, you're completely right. So what we're going to do, we're going to reset everything and just show you exactly what's going on. So there's more to the story than meets the eye. Well, literally. So what we'll do, we'll go back to axial view. Uh, I'm going to rotate this patient all the way back around again. And we're going to go back to bone windows. And then what we all can do is go all the way back down to the sacroiliac joints. And you can see those sacroiliac joints are down here. And I'm going to point that out for anyone that doesn't know that. These are the sacroiliac joints here and here. But these sacroiliac, sacroiliac joints look slightly abnormal. They look like they've actually fused together. They look very, very abnormal. They've kind of got this kind of erosive appearance to it, and they kind of look like they've kind of merged into one another. They don't look like normal sacroiliac joints at all. And the reason I was trying to show you the sagittal views as well is because when you go to the bone windows, what you should have is a joint, right, between the facet joints. But the facet joints, if you come here, they almost look like they're joined to one another. Now, the facet joints are like any other joint, right? They've got cyanosium, they've got all the other things that a other joint would be. So you can get rheumatoid arthritis, get destructive process there. But in this particular situation, you've got ankylosis of the sacred, the uh, facet joints as well. So when you've got ankylosis of the facet joints and you've got sort of ankylosis of the sacred joints as well, uh, sacroiliac joints as well then you've got something called what is known as sacroiliitis so yeah you know we've gone and treated the initial problem which was the stones but this person comes keeps coming in with back pain they keep having stones and the reason is because they've got ankylosing spondylitis that are on painkillers to try and help it and that kind of predisposes them to be what essentially is a stone former so hopefully that's something that kind of shows you that maybe just thinking a little bit further than 
you know what you see is a good way to go when doing these things and that's why you, you know you just don't stop at stone you think why is this person having so many stones what's the issue here all right this should be a slam dunk one i know someone will get this very very quickly for those of you that can see it great well done for those of you that can't don't worry i'm going to work through it very very quickly like I, as always i always go for the apcs first I sometimes even draw a little square just to make sure that I've had a good look at the lung parenchyma, make sure there's no evidence of any pneumothorax at all. And then, yeah, someone's done it. Well done. You've, you've thrown it. You've got it. But um, then the rest of the lungs look very, very clear. The ribs look very, very normal as well. I always actually, and I just don't say they look normal. I follow them around, follow them around, follow them around. So you've got the back ribs, lateral ribs going forwards, back ribs, lateral ribs going forwards. I follow them all the way down. I look behind the heart to make sure there's no problems. Look under the hilum, uh, look at behind the hilum, they look okay. Costophrenic cargoes look okay. And the final thing is to look under the hemi diaphragms. And then you may think to say, oh, that's a stomach bubble. But actually, you're on the wrong side. This is not the stomach bubble. This patient's got some free air located exactly right under the right hemi diaphragm. Therefore, this person's got a perforated intra-abdominal viscous and will need to go on to get a CT scan because of their abdominal pain. So just something that's fairly straightforward. Don't worry, I'm kind of going between cases, and there are reasons as to why I'm doing this. So um, this is free air under the abdomen and on the right side right so we are going to move on to kind of more kind of hopefully standard these things so this one can be a bit little a little bit difficult for people we're looking at the calcanium and what we can see here if you don't see it originally um what you do is generally speaking is go down and have a look at the you know the lateral malleolus make sure that's kind of nice then you want to look at the rest of the, you know, the distal tibia plafond as well. Make sure you have a look at the um, Taylor dome. Make sure there's no osteochondral defect. Sometimes you see a little osteochondral defect there. Next thing is to make sure you've had a look at the base of the fifth. Cheeky little fractures can turn up there as well. So they all look okay. Nothing abnormal. So you could walk away thinking everything's all right. But actually, one thing you'll notice as you start getting better and better is that this soft tissue around this region is just so, so thick. This is really, really, really fat, really, really fat. So you think, so yeah, it could be plantar fasciitis. It could be. But then, you know, you can almost see a little, little bit of sort of this um, plantar fascia just sitting there. If you zoom in, I hopefully can convince you that you can see a bit of a plantar fascia just sitting there look particularly thick but look x-rays aren't the best way to look for plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. but then as you start cl looking closer you start to see that there is this kind of sclerotic lines going like this sclerotic line going like this and that's not quite normal trabeculations like this but you've got a sclerotic line going along like so so what's actually happened is that you've got this sort of stress fracture stress reaction going on within this region extensive soft tissue reaction as well going on here so this is going to most likely to be an actual calcaneal injury uh, if not, if it's not an acute injury, it's going to be a stress fracture, stress reaction, because this linear density going along this way is completely at odds to the linear trabeculation that you have, and you've got extensive soft tissue swelling as well. So I would actually bet uh, against plantar fasciitis on that particular x-ray. So we're going to get to some juicy CTs in just a second. Hopefully this is a straightforward one. Go on, I know you're going to get it. You've been giving us some good answers, so you just go for it. Yeah, I know you can see it. So obviously I would be a bit careful where, unless you've got a dedicated view of the shoulder, but yeah, you're exactly right. There is this ACJ abnormality. Now, sometimes people will try and call an ACJ abnormality um, on, a, on a shoulder x-ray. And I would, I would shy away from it if it's not blindingly obvious, because unless you've got an on fast, complete view of the uh, acromic clavicular joint, sometimes things that are in line can look slightly out of line. Did you want to talk or did you just press hand? Oh, that's someone else. Okay. So then, um, so then like you can have something like this, which is completely aligned with one another. But if you look at it at a bit of an angle, bit of an angle, it starts to look out of line with another, but actually I'm completely in line. So you could be careful, right? Because I've seen people call the chromoclavicular uh, subluxation dislocations on normal, pretty normal x-rays actually on the shoulder because they're not dedicated images. But in this particular situation, this definitely 100% is a, um, a chromoclavicular dislocation because this or subluxation because this and this are completely out of line with one another. And the thing, next thing you want to know is that, oh yeah, someone's been on the classification as well. Um, you've got these ligaments that are over here. You've got your conoid and trapezoid ligaments, right? And so these can rip. If, they, if it gets a particularly bad uh, injury, then they can tear. And when you've got tears, then you may actually have a bit of fleck of bone being pulled away, right? So that's something else to be wary of. When you got this rip of a ligament, then that means that this patient's had a quite significant injury that's probably not going to get better. And what they can actually do is they can actually put like a, a little button around here, put a bit of a rope line around here and just pull it together and make sure that they've got sort of an artificial ligament in that situation. But like I say, I would be careful 
uh, when calling a chromic clavicular subluxations and dislocations on a non-dedicated view. Well, this particular one is blindingly obvious, completely blindly obvious. But but sometimes, I mean, you know, just don't go for subtleties when it comes to when it comes to this kind of thing. Right. So case number seven is a CT scan. Um, and so I'm just going to download it. You guys can have a quick flick through as well. I'm just going to change the windows. So yeah, someone's already seen there's something quite abnormal there, but we've got to think a little bit further. What's causing it? Uh, you know, yeah, you, you're right. What's causing it? What's happened? Why has this person got such extensive uh, what you've said? So let's go from the top because not, I, I know that people have different varying abilities. So as we scroll from the top, straight away you'll see that the lungs are here, but you've got what looks like a fluid uh, signal, fluid density located within the posterior aspects of both lungs. And you can see some collapse and consolidation located with both lung bases. I know this is consolidation because you can see that there are air bronchograms sitting within these regions. This is the aorta going down. Aorta is always on the left. AOL is one way to do it. It looks very, very circular, very, very circular on this particular scan. But then next week, you've got your IVC. That looks slightly less enhancing. But when you go to the portal vein, which is over here, you can see that's slightly denser than the aorta. So therefore, this must be a portal venous system, a portal venous scan. Right. So we've kind of established that. We've established we've got bilateral pleural effusions and a portal venous scan image. Coming further down, you can actually see there's some fluid sitting over here within the abdomen. So you've got intra-abdominal free fluid. You've got a few cysts sitting here as well. That looks completely fine. Let's have a look at the gallbladder. Gallbladder looks okay. Pancreas, what does that look like? Oh, looks like there's a few calcifications within this pancreas. Can you see that? That's the pancreas, a few punctate calcifications sitting within that region as well. So this person may have had previous episodes of pancreatitis. The spleen is sitting down here as well. So everything looks okay from that point of view. And yes, someone has already pointed out that they've got what looks like extensive air located within the subcutaneous tissues. So how do I know that's air? So see this stuff over here. This is subcutaneous tissues. There's some fluid located here, that's subcutaneous edema, but you've also got what looks like subcutaneous uh, emphysema. So you've got air located within the subcutaneous tissues. How do I know that? Because look, air is over here, air is also over here, air is in, within the bowel, but air should not really be within the subcutaneous tissues. Now, alcoholic pancreatitis, can, can, can that cause this? Not really. Pancreatitis is not going to really cause something like this. This is um, quite extensive uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Patient's very, very unwell, and you've also got sub subcutaneous edema, intra-abdominal ascites, bilateral pleural effusions, and bilateral collapse as consolidation of both lungs. So there is a lot going on in this patient. So this patient's clearly quite unwell. Come further down, you start to notice that the air looks a little bit abnormal here, and you've got a bit of what looks like a bit of collection. Coming further down, this collection, or whatever this is, with a bit of air located, where it extends further down, further down, and now you're coming up all the way down to the groin. Well done. So as you come further down, you can see this goes further down into here and actually splits into two. And yeah, you're right. Exactly right. And this is located within what looks like within the scrotal sac. So you've got someone who's got extensive amount of fluid located within the scrotal sac. You've got extensive emphysema or locus of air located within the scrotal sac as well. And you've got this air that extends upwards away from there and then into here. So yeah, exactly right. This is called corneous gangrene. Right. Very, very uh, serious disease in terms of this is a surgical emergency. This patient needs to be seen as soon as possible because they've got such extensive infection involving their scrotal region that it's extended further and into the subcutaneous tissue as well. But does the story end there? Exactly. Necrotizing fasciitis, the subsidiary or the sub, sub subject of that is going to be fornia's, ga fornia's gangrene. Where did this come from? Yeah, I get it. We said that this, this has come from here, but could it have come from anywhere else? So now, if you look a bit further down, you can see this kind of veers backwards, points backwards, goes around this way, goes all the way around here and all the way around the back. And this is within the region of the rectum and the anus. So therefore, this is actually, all this, this whole thing started with perianal abscess. This patient was a inflammatory bowel disease. I think they were Crohn's. They were known to have perianal abscesses. It got worse and worse and worse, couldn't get better, extended forwards into the scrotum and then ended up becoming fornia's gangrene. So quite an interesting case and an unfortunate case. Patient didn't do well at all, but very, very unwell patient. Right, so that is fornia's gangrene extending from probably quite an unusual area. It was um, 
perineal abscess was extended into the scrotum and got even worse for this patient. Right, let's have a look at this one. This turns up on your reporting file. And um, what you can straight away see is that, okay, we're looking at some hands. Some of the hands look a bit wonky. Look at that hand over there. It doesn't look quite right, does it? Look at that. Kind of does this and then kind of goes that way. So that's one thing we've seen, right? Having a look at the rest of the hands, okay, the joints here look okay. Radiocarpal joint looks okay. Radiocarpal joint looks okay. But you start to notice that there are a few areas of this increased density, increased density, increased density located within this region over here, getting there. And then you kind of look at these joints. This is the metacarpal phalangeal joints. They all look pretty smooth. No big issues there at all. But look at the rest of the joints. Then you start to see what looks like a radiolucency there, a radiolucency over here. And even more obvious, a big radiolucency, like someone's come and bitten away. So some people have called this a rat bite. I don't know why they say rat bite. I mean, anything could bite. A rabbit could bite. Cat could bite. I don't know. But you can see that these are, oh, I don't know, my drawing's just gone badly there. But you've got a bite there, a bite there. And these are periarticular. So these are outside of the joints. These are not involving the joints at all. So these are periarticular erosions. So look, our intraarticular erosions would be here. Periarticular erosions are around the joint, away from the joint, or all around here. Also, when you look a bit closer, you can see that there's an increased density located within these regions here, in this region here, more erosive arthropathy over here, more erosive and rat bites there, more soft tissue density here, soft tissue density here. Yeah, exactly right. So these are, this is actually, because, yeah, this is um, gout. This is exactly gout. So it wouldn't be going down rheumatoid arthritis, almost classical of gout. It's affecting multiple joints in this particular situation. You may have a situation where gout can only affect one big joint. Normally, it's going to be the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the toe. Sometimes it can be the elbow, but in this particular situation, the gout has got so bad that it's affecting multiple small joints as well. So quite unusual in that regard. But the actual appearances in terms of soft tissue density, periarticular erosions is a pathognomic almost for, for gout. So what do you do next? You look at the urate levels, you look at previous imaging to see where there's a pattern. Uh, and the urate levels, if they're raised, and it's more than likely to be uh, gout. And then what you can also do if you really need to, if you're very, very stuck, you can actually take a sample of this and send off to the labs and see what the urate crystals look like. And they do this bifringent thing that I can barely remember anymore from my FRCR radiology days, from the FR exam days. Um, okay, let's have a look at the shoulder. Let's have a look at the shoulder. What are people thinking about this shoulder? So we talked about the clavicle not so long ago. We've seen clavicle fractures over this series of cases that we've done. We've seen dislocations as well. Um, this clavicle looks pretty well aligned, doesn't it? It doesn't look like there's anything going on at all. It looks very, very well aligned. So we're not thinking there's a clavicle problem here. Look at the medial. Sometimes I've seen dislocations going on there. I've seen fractures of the lateral acromion. I've seen calcifications be here, whether you've got calcifor, calcific tendinosis as well. And then you've got your head of humerus there. Someone's gone, gone for it. Yeah, you've seen something right, but try and localize it. Um, and then you've got your, yeah, your greater tuberosity. I've seen fractures being missed there as well. So just be careful. You can get greater tuberosity fractures. What you do also have is your biceps tendon going through here, going all the way along, attached to here. Sometimes you get avulsions here. You get indentation fractures here. You can get bank heart fractures also because you've got an anterior dislocation. A few things can happen. Sometimes I've literally seen like an erosive destructive process just at the bottom here. So it can be really, really difficult. But someone has said a few things already, which is great. So what we've got, we've got to start looking at the rest of the things, right? So you've got one rib. Oh, hang on. Where's that second rib? Can you see that second rib? Third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, sixth rib, seventh rib. Yeah, so that second rib doesn't look right, does it? So well done, whoever's picked that up. That looks very, very abnormal. What well, looks like a soft tissue density. It's not, it's going to be kind of on the outside of the chest wall. Remember what I said, a very well-defined inner margin, not so well-defined outer margin. This extends beyond the chest wall. The scapula doesn't look like it's being involved, but that destructive process located within that second rib is very, very concerning, especially in someone who's an older adult patient. You've got to be worried that this is going to be an underlying malignancy. You've got to be, right? I mean, it's going to be a destructive, expansile, bony lesion, right? So yeah, that's exactly right. This patient has got um, a destructive bony. It's a bit of red herring. You're looking for the shoulder pain. They've got shoulder pain. Of course they do. But it's actually the second rib where the abnormality lies. So very, very abnormal for this patient. Right, let's have a look at this one. Next case, we have a lumbar spine. So uh, lumbar spine, kind of related to what we were talking about earlier, 
First off, this patient is an older patient. You know that because this patient has got this atherosclerosis sitting within their aorta. I've seen aneurysms of aortas that are seen on lumbar spine x-rays. It's very, very important that you do have a look. But now we're looking at this, we can again see that there is no evidence of any gross abnormalities in terms of any soft tissue calcifications or anything like that. Well done, someone's picked it up. Can everyone see that? That little calcification sitting there. Where is that? Right upper quadrant. So it could be gallstones, right? Looks like this person may have gallstones, yeah? And then, yeah, someone has correctly said that they can see ankylosis again. So look, you can see flowing osteophytes, very different from the other one. Yeah, bamboo spine, exactly. Right. All the right words are flying out now. You can see what looks like flowing osteophytosis or oste yeah, flowing calcification go all the way down like this, not osteophytosis. You've got flowing ossification of the longitudinal ligaments anteriorly, maybe some of the posterior area as well. You can see that there's kind of blunting. You know, normally these are very, very sharp contours, but they're not. They're very blunted as well. Looking at the AP view, you can see the sacroiliac joints aren't so visible anymore. They've ankylosed completely. They've also got, look, hip replacements as well. Can you see, can see that? Why would they get hip replacements? They're prone to having avascular necrosis as well. I mean, they can get, um, they'll be on non-steroidals and all that kind of thing. That can result in these issues where they've got these problems with their, their joints get a vascular necrosis and that kind of thing. So yeah, one of the big things you want to, want to make sure is that they don't have a fracture. Very difficult to see any fractures here on this particular situation, no fractures. But when they get a fracture, they get fractured through multiple. Mm -hmm. You know, normally if someone has a fracture, they get fractured through one bit, but because there's transmitting forces, you get fractures literally through all three columns. So they just get a completely unstable, unstable spine. So very, very important that we're aware that when we see ankylosing spondylitis. Um, so let's go to the next case. Uh, this looks like this is case number 11. It's number 11. Okay, so case number 11. Uh, I'm just going to download the images while I do that. You guys have a look and tell me what you think. A patient came in with abdominal pain. Well done. Someone's picked up the big first finding. Don't worry. I'm going to go through very, from the very, very beginning for everyone. Okay. So that I know that we've got varying ability here as well. So just wait for that download. Okay. So let's go from the very, very top. Once we get there. Okay. Let's see some answers. So someone saying sh small SBO, which means small bowel obstruction. Yeah. Perfect. That's good. Okay, so almost there uh, was some, yeah, someone saying small bowel obstruction as well. But what's causing it? What's causing it? What's causing the small bowel obstruction? It can't just come out of the blue. These are all good things, all good things. But we still need to know the answer. We still need to know the answer. Why has this person got small bowel obstruction? Well, is it small bowel obstruction? So very from the very, very top, we can see the aorta. We can see a few calcifications around the aorta. It tells you the patient a little bit older. Coming further down, we can still keep our eyes on the aorta. Aorta is kind of almost the same density as the porta venous system because it's not as bright as the bone next to it. I would say there's most likely to be in between a porta venous image rather than just a pure a arterial image rather than a, um, a straight porta venous image as well. Okay, so we've all got a few renal cysts sitting here as well. The gallbladder is sitting over here. Can you see that? That look, doesn't look like it's particularly inflamed. Now we're coming up to the pancreas. Remember, we had the pancreas last time, had a few calcifications within it. This pancreas looks normal. That's a spleen over here, maybe a little bit small. Not sure that's entirely related to what the bigger picture is. So now we go further down into the abdomen. And we start, some people have noticed that there are a few loops of dilated bowel. Is a small bowel, is a large bowel. So these uh, bits of bowel here look like small bowel because they've got these kind of slightly more hyper-enhancing valvular conventes, right? So what I generally do is whenever I've got a bowel obstruction or what looks like it could be a bowel obstruction is what we've got here. I go all the way to the bottom and just have a look and make sure there's no hernias because hernias are quick, done. Once you've got a hernia, you've done. So in this particular situation, we do have what looks like a hernia. So that looks like a hernia, but does it contain any bowel? So you think, okay, you know, you can say to yourself, yeah, I've done it, I've sorted it. I know what the problem is. I think this is going to be a small bowel obstruction secondary to a hernia. Also, what you see is that this patient's got contrast within their urinary bladder already. So they've clearly had a scan at some point fairly recently, and they've popped up again because they're not, get, not getting any better. So now what we'll do is if this was if the hernia was causing the obstruction, then anything coming out of the hernia would be dilated bowel. But when we go and have a look here, you can see that bowel coming out there actually looks completely normal caliber. So therefore, this hernia is not causing the problem whatsoever. Someone's already said what it is coming up. 
So my, your constants, whenever you're looking at CT, if you do get lost, there's the ascending and the descending colon. Ascending colon is going to be here. Descending colon is going to be over here. We follow this up, follow this up. It looks okay. It looks okay. It looks okay. I'm ignoring all the other bowel for now. Still, still looks okay. Still looks okay. Still looks okay. Coming up and then look, it gets very, very thickened around there, right? Very, very thickened around this area. You've got a bit of kind of calcification sitting in here, probably ingested material. And then from this point onwards, it starts to get a little bit dilated and a bit of fecally loaded. See a lot of feces here, transverse colon, very, very dilated. And then, you know, what, as you come further down, further down, you can see, look, the, this bowel looks slightly dilated. Lots of feces within there, within there as well. What may be happening is that ileocecal valve, some of that back pressure has gone backwards into that small bowel as well. But they actually, the problem is exactly what that, so that person has said. It's a tumor that is located within the, uh, well, you said uh, descending colon. Yeah, that's pretty much right, actually. So over here is a splenic flexure coming up here. So it's a bit further down from there. So what's actually happened is that the red herring in this particular situation you think is a hernia. And I would still encourage anyone, if you do have any bowel obstruction, is to go straight down to the groins and just make sure there's no hernia that's causing it. But then ask yourself the next question. If the hernia is causing it, why is it that bowel that's going into there not dilated because if the hernia was causing it then any bowel coming out of there would be dilated which is not the case the dilatation happens around this region of the descending colon so therefore this is in keeping with a uh, tumor and then obviously you want to look at everything else and make sure there's no um, you know malignant um, there's no uh, spread of this tumor but in this particular situation we can't see any spread of any tumor anywhere at all so this is, yeah, so this is basically a small uh, a bowel obstruction secondary to a large tumour. Right, let's have a look at this one. How much time do we have? I do want to go through that case that someone has sent us. So let's go through this. Love this case. This patient has come in with previous history of uh, bowel surgery, and they're not feeling very well at all. And um, yeah, let's just leave it at that. So they've, they've had bowel surgery and they're not feeling well. Yeah, we'll just say that. So they, this patient, this came in the middle of the night from what I remember. I remember feeling very tired when I saw this. And this one literally has like, I think if I remember, has like five different findings. So if, if you can, you know, if someone's smashing it, go for it. Like throw your five different findings before I even get through the first one. So again, let's go from the very, very top. Got the aorta sitting over here. What you can see is the NG tube is not adequately placed, right? So that's number one. Abnormal finding, the NG tube needs to be a bit further down, doesn't it? It can't be sitting there, but increase the risk of aspiration, finding number one. Coming further down, yeah, we've got a simple cyst, not that big deal, no one cares. But you can see this high-density fluid sitting within this region over here. Can you see that? High-density fluid, high-density fluid. This does not look like a fluid from, like, let's say, the urinary bladder. So if we go down to the urinary bladder, if we can see it at all, now, where is the urinary bladder? So urinary bladder catheters there, so we can't see the urinary bladder. That's one way to be able to see uh, whether something is fluid or not. Okay, so anyway, this is high-density fluid. If I was to get a Hauser unit, can I do that? Anyway, look, uh, if you were to get a Hauser unit, it would be higher, higher than 20, 30, which would be fluid, right? Then you come further down and you think, okay, so there's fluid, I'm worried, what's going on? Um, the re video recording will be on the YouTube channel, Collected Minds, later probably tomorrow. So when you come down to this region, having a look at that fluid, you can see that there's a layer. Can you see that? It's a layer here, and that looks kind of dark or kind of brighter, so that's dense. And then you've got that kind of slightly less dense fluid, so you've got what looks like a very, very large intra-abdominal slash pelvic hematoma. Look, it's all to do... Remember how we're talking about gravity and the way it looks? So look, you can see that this is this is the table. So gravity would be this way. So anything high density would be going backwards. So yeah, someone said a few things already. That's good. So we've got uh, some blood sitting there. So that's uh, probably abnormality number two. So where is the bowel here? So bowel doesn't look like it's hyper enhancing at all. So that's bowel there. You can see that the wall is enhancing, but here the wall is not enhancing at all. And you, now here, you can't really see the bowel all that differently from that hematoma sitting within the pelvis. So what you're actually looking for, looking at right now, is actually bowel ischemia. There's lack of blood flow. So when you've got lack of blood flow, you've got a bleed, you've got to start thinking to yourself, what's going on? They must have, they've got hypovolemia. That's what's going on, right? So another way to look for hypovolemia is to have a look at the IVC and look if it's flattened. Yeah, pancake IVC. So that's what they call a pancake IVC. That means that this patient's got hypovolemia, right? So that's the, that's the other thing. 
So that's it. That's good. All right. So the other thing to notice is if you look at that kidney, can you see that kidney compared to that kidney? That kidney looks slightly dusky in enhancement. Doesn't look quite right, does it? Look, that kidney, that kidney. Now look at that kidney. Remember we we're looking at hydronephrosis and hydrourethra on that previous study with the ankylosing spondylitis? This one has got hydronephrosis and hydrourethra as well. So um, yeah, I know it's not very reliable, but you know, you've got how you've got a flattened IVC and you've got a big bleed going on. So just something to mention. And then what you can see is that you've got this um what looks like renal tract obstruction. So what's causing it? Is it a stone? Come further down, come further down, follow that ureter all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, kind of losing it. No, it's not the stone, it's the hematoma itself is now causing a right-sided, um, right-sided renal tract obstruction. So we've got a few findings right so far. We've got the NG tube that's incorrectly placed, we've got high density fluid within the abdomen, in the pelvis as well, and you've got ischemic bowel, and you've got a right renal tract obstruction. Are we done? No, we're not done. There's one more, there's one more big one, one more big finding, right? So now we've got to start thinking about, okay, what is going on? So this is over here. Is that bowel or is that not bowel? That's bowel. That's not bowel. That's hematoma. Coming further up, you can see that there is a layer sitting here. Can you see that? Coming further up, you can see that actually over here, there's some hematoma. And over here is a bit of hematoma and some high density material. That high density is almost the same density as what is located within the aorta. Therefore, this would be consistent with an active bleed. So this patient's got active bleed because it's got contrast that is actively extravasating into a region of hematoma. So the active bleed is sitting within this region. So therefore, you've got so many findings. NG tube, uh, you've got the hematoma, you've got ischemic bowel, collapsed, IV, collapsed IVC, you've got a right renal tract obstruction and active bleeding located within that right mid-abdomen. So a lot going on and a lot needs to be done for this patient. It's clearly very, very, very unwell. So that's a really good case, Alan. I love that case um, because I think he's just got a lot of things to take away and a lot of sort of this leads to this, this leads to this, and this leads to this. So I'm really, really, really super grateful. We have got this scan, as far as I'm aware. Oh, um, are the adrenals considered bright or a sign of shock? Yeah, so um, yeah, I've seen that. Um, what can happen sometimes is that patients can have a hypovolemic um, shock syndrome where their adrenals start to hyper-enhance. Um, I haven't seen it happen very often, but I think in this situation, if we come up to the adrenals, they do look slightly bright, slightly brighter than you usually would. It's kind of a soft sign, really. But um, in the context of everything else, I mean, yeah, you know, hypovolemia, isn't it? You've got I've collapsed IVC, you've got big intra-abdominal intra intrapelvic bleed. Yeah, this is, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, IV, the adrenals are slightly enhancing as well. So anyway, I'm, I'm extremely honored that we've got this case from, um, this case is from Fiji apparently. Uh, who gave it to us? Someone did tell me who it was. This. So I'm going to name drop if you don't mind. I hope you don't mind. So we have got a, a collector of mine, a regular, who was radiologist of the month. Uh, Kamari uh, Kati, I hope I said this right, my apologies. Kati, Katiriwa. She's donated this case for us to look at today uh, for an unfortunate patient that they had come in. So let's have a look. So first off, from the scanogram, yeah, these scanograms, honestly, sometimes, you know, when you see a scanogram, you think, oh, great, I'm not looking forward to this one. It's not going to be nice. All right. So um, scanogram, for those of you that don't know, is what they use to try and plan the scan prior to taking the scan in the first place. And straight away, you can see that there is something that doesn't look quite right there. Like, what on earth could that be? Is that artifact or what could that be? So then we have a look at the, um, we have a look at this particular, and let's stop that. Oops. Sorry, I've gone and closed it. Let's open it again open it and let's download that one and go for our screen one do that okay so um this does not look like a happy person at all from the scanogram you could tell straight away and straight away from here you can see that this does not does not look quite right at all either so straight away like with the other case do you remember we had uh yeah so it is trauma quite significant trauma um, we had emphysema with pile in the front. We had free air located within the subcutaneous tissues. In this particular situation as well, we've again got free air located within the subcutaneous tissues. Again, look, um, even on the bone windows. I'm sorry if you can hear that, by the way. It's my kid in the background. Um, you can see that there is some subcutaneous air over here and over here. So something's not right. Something's happened here that's not quite right. 
on the lung window, you can see that there is also what looks like a pneumothorax as well. So we're going to go back to the soft tissue windows. This is a non-contrast study on this patient, right? So we can see some air located within the fascial planes, located uh, on the left side of the body. Coming further down, some more air located between the fascial planes. You've got the paraspinal muscles, latissimus dorsi. You've got your scapular muscles over here, the infraspinatus um, over here as well. Actually, when you look at this, this muscular over, musculature over here looks very much thickened compared to that musculature. So this could be a case of like intramuscular hematoma as well. Looking at the subcutaneous tissues, if you look at that, it looks slightly thickened compared to there. You can see that there is some stranding over here, some fat stranding. So this is not happy looking at all. Coming further down, further down. Whoa, okay. It just hits you, doesn't it? Or well, even worse, the patient, it hit the patient. So there looks like there is this massive metallic object, which is literally, unfortunately, impaled this patient. Looks like there's a few. Um, I don't even know what kind of, I know I'm asking the same question as you. What object is that? I don't know. I don't know because I've seen knives you know go through i've seen you know po i've actually seen one where someone someone was like they were cleaning yeah and then they were they the, what they usually do on the day-to-day -day, they they sweep and then they throw their broomstick and they jump onto their onto the floor next to the broomstick on this particular unfortunate occasion the broomstick kind of flipped back on it and they jumped into the broomstick and the broomstick impaled them so i see broomsticks but i've never seen anything like this because this looks like a pole with like multiple nails within it. And I have no idea how on earth it's managed to sort of get through, you know, it's got through. And what's really bad about this is kind of shattered through here. You've got multiple broken bones. It's gone stuck into the chest cavity. Even more than that, I suspect it's probably broken a few vertebral levels as well. So that transverse process there looks broken. That laminar process, the spinous process looks broken. You've got some... Um, You've got some of that osseous structure, the, some of the broken bones extending into the spinal canal there as well. That's going to have some significant mass effect onto the spinal canal. You're probably going to have some significant contusion of the spinal cord within this region. You can see a few locules of air as well, maybe located within that spinal canal as well. So sometimes what you'll end up happening, having is a few locules of air further up, not in this particular situation just yet, but the air can travel up and down the spinal canal as well. Thankfully, they haven't hit the heart. They haven't hit any of the mediastinal structures. Going back into the lung windows, we're going to see, um, yeah, so you can see this object sitting over here. You can see this fluffiness sitting within this region. These are going to be uh, lung contusions, lung bleeds, lots of lots of fluffy stuff all the way over here. Yes, someone's already noticed. They've got a pneumothorax as evidenced by this kind of clear area over here. Next to the pneumothorax, has everything shifted across? Are we dealing with a pneumothorax? Tension pneumothorax? No, doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like a tension pneumothorax at all. Um, let's have a look at the rest of the lung windows. Hang on. Just make sure there's no other injuries on the other side. Clearly, the patient's breathing a lot as well because, you know, they're in a lot of pain. So you can't see the lung parenchyma all so well. It all looks very, very shadowy there at the moment. But yeah, they've got multiple rib fractures on this side. You see, like, there's going to be shattered ribs on this side here, rib fracture there. So it's been a significantly impacted. So I wonder whether they've had an accident, they've been hit by something. And that's was what, what has resulted in the significant injury. Is the diaphragm okay with such a big injury? I've seen the situation where the di diaphragm can burst because such a significant injury on the chest can result in a pushing of the diaphragm. You can end up getting um, hernias and stuff, but in this particular situation, we don't. And the liver and the upper abdominal solid organs do not look too bad either. So this patient is very, 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 very unwell. They've got a really significant injury. And I'm very, very worried about this patient because not, uh, not, not just because of what's happened to the bones, but the significant encroachment of the spinal canal in this particular situation. Right. So I think I have been through every single case that we've got. Um, and I really, really appreciate that someone from halfway around the world not only takes part in Collective Minds, takes part in these uh, webinars that we do so regularly and there's some significant benefit and hopefully benefit people around the world i've seen some familiar names today which is really lovely to see you keep coming back and uh, door hinge or tv aerial yeah maybe it could be couldn't it yeah it could be 
I wonder. I wonder if um, our colleague will let us know at some point. Um, yeah, I'll try and reach out to them and ask them if they know what that was. And on the next webinar, I'll, I'll tell you what it is and maybe even go through it one more time for those that didn't see it. But really phenomenal case, really appreciate it. Please do keep adding me, follow me on Twitter, follow me on YouTube, my own YouTube channel, follow the Collective Minds Radiology YouTube channel as well. Do check out radiologyseminars.co.uk, which is a, a place I work with where I do lecturing. And some of it may be useful for you guys, you never know. We try and keep things... Um, as good as possible. So anyway, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hand it across to Seidel, uh, who will be taking over and seeing us out. And as always, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Yeah, Bye. thank you so much, uh, Imran. I mean, uh, everyone in the chat agrees with me. Amazing, amazing webinar, as always. It's exactly like Imran says, you know, if you want uh, him to look at your case, uh, all you have to do essentially is just upload a case on the global community uh, and then at Doc Lasker and hand and, uh, and he will put it in your case collection or in this case collection. So uh, now I will send out a feedback evaluation form. So if you have some time over, make sure to you know, fill that out because it helps, helps us provo provide more value to you as participants. Uh, I will also send out the CPD certificates together with the evaluation form. So uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the, this webinar will be hosted on our YouTube channel. So if you, uh, if you want to look at this one again or go over the cases, there are posts on the global community. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys. I see, I see a lot of thank yous. So uh, I wish you a pleasant, pleasant day and I hope to see you on the next webinar.